As a director, one of the most powerful things you can do is just be confident and just hold on a shot. And so we were switching between these really fast shots that build energy and these other shots that we were just living in. And at the end of the day, we were like, do we actually believe in this idea or is this something we want to just move on from? And we were like, I think this idea is worth doing even if we fund it ourselves. I felt very comfortable in every other part of the process. And I was like, I feel so out of my league here. Literally within 30 minutes of us shooting stuff, I was like, this is the funnest thing ever. We're still actually finishing all the financials. Oh, wow. <laughs> so right. <laughs> I bought in no, you fucker. <laughs> <laughs> Just for production expenses, I think Nick and I put up 15. And that's one of the beautiful things to leverage with spec pieces is you can go out and create a piece like this. You can kind of put the stake in the ground further than where you already have it. And then you can go up and, oh, hey, you know, we're capable of shooting a 150K spot or a 300 or half a million dollar spot. And all of a sudden, all your investment was just this, like a fraction of that. How did you decide what you wanted to pick up? And how did you decide eventually what you wanted to say goodbye to? Yeah, that's a great question. It's not always practical, but I feel like the answer is curiosity. At the time, I was like, I want more travel content on the page. And then all of a sudden, we just kept going and kept the momentum going. So it's funny, dude, because I was so I was in Norway and I was making travel videos. <laughs> Clients never came. Dude. <laughs> and all of a sudden, like three guys come out on their scooters after us. It's like pitch black in the middle of these alleyways. He lunges at me and pulls the keys out of my hand or like out of the bike or whatever. Oh. And he's like, other two guys are approaching. Essentially, what happened before these two guys came up is Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in to episode 95 of the 505 Podcast. Today, we are welcomed by a very special guest. We got Mitchell Mullins in the house. Man, this was one of the most fun conversations I think we've had. We nerded out on this Rivian commercial that he made uh, with one of his buddies, and they had an awesome team that helped out on this. It's stunning. You should go to his Instagram that's linked down below. You should watch it before you get into the pod because it looks like they made the trailer for Dune, dude. The fact that that was a spec ad. Unbelievable. I mean, and you know, he tells us how much he spent to make that happen. God. And the fact that they pulled off what they pulled off with the amount of money that they spent is insane. Not only is he talented, but like everybody that he brought on to that spec ad is, in, is insanely talented. And I'm just jealous because I feel like he's living out my dream, like travel the world at like 18, 19. Ridiculous. On the road for 300 days. And then his transition to become this like insanely talented director making these epic pieces. I'm like, when I grow up, I'm trying to be Mitchell Mullins. Yeah, he he was traveling at the time where that was that was like the thing on Instagram. It was it. It was it, you know? And he, he learned how to backflip. He went to the academy, yeah. got that whole thing out of his system. Uh, and he, he saw like so many different cool parts of the world, was working with all these big brands. I think he's gonna give you guys a ton of insight on how to go and transition. Because many of you might might feel maybe pigeonholed in what you do. You might yeah. be doing something and you're like, I want to totally shift 180 to it and I want to do this. I think he gives really practical advice on making the shift in something that you're doing. And dude, he gave us a gift. Bro, first time in pod history. Unbelievable. Gave us a notebook, dude. Yeah. You got, it's going to be a really fun episode. Also, I'm a softball champion for those that were wondering. I took home the ship, dude. We played insane. I was making grabs in the outfield. We like out there. Prime Mookie bets, dude. No airs, just RBIs, dude. I know. I know what you're going to say. The only thing. Yep. Tell the people, dude. You were about 90, 95% confident we can roll the clip back yep, yep. that you were going to hit a, a home run. I was pretty pissed. I won't and, lie. Yeah. I mean, listen, did you put the team on your back? Are you the best hitter on the team? Absolutely. Thank you. But- I wanted to get my money's worth. I yeah. spent a lot of money on these seats. I know. I was sitting, you know, right behind the dugout. Yep. And um, I wanted to see some dingers and you just didn't deliver. I know. And I, the double wasn't enough for me. No. You know, I was pissed all night. I didn't sleep all night. I wasn't satisfied with that win. I wouldn't I wouldn't have been able to sleep either. Yeah, it was brutal. But we took it home. There was a few rocks that showed out. Shout out yeah. to the boys that came. We got Keith. We got uh, another homie came through. It was it was a fun time. It was uh, it was fun. I, I was hyped that we took it home because I wouldn't have slept. But dude, also something that Mitchell talked about in this uh, in this pod that I want to share with you guys is he was sharing his process for kind coming up with these pieces. And yeah. I think it's something that you can all take and put it into your work, whether you're working on a $500 project or a free project, right? And, and just see the level of, um, see the level of commitment that he puts into anything that he does, whether and detail. it's detail, dude, yeah. whether it's spec, whether it's yes. a huge commercial that he's working on, um, whether it's just something for fun with his friends, whether it's a journal, right? Yeah. It, it, the level of effort that he puts in across the board is immaculate. And 
something that I took away from him was he, he's very curious, very curious yes. guy, right? He does, he does all these things at a really high level. And I feel like most creative people that we talk to or that we know, usually they do one thing really well. Nothing wrong with he that. He does it all. He does it all, dude. The guy can fly the drone. It's frustrating. Yeah. It, it's like, dude. And on top of it all. Leave some creativity for the rest of us. And on top of it all, kind of ripped. And he's rocking the mullet. Like, (laughs) what the? It's not fair. We got a fellow mullet guy on the pod (laughs) with Chase to join Chase. But hey, without further ado, let's get into episode 95. Right, real quick, before we get into the episode. Okay, we got to talk about the trip, dude. Yes. Okay, it's really important. We're going on a trip with the Rocks. Okay, you, me, Chase, we're going somewhere. We're going to Yellowstone National Park. That's what we ended up deciding on. You guys voted on this. And we we think it's going to make the most sense for the first one to do it in the United States. We don't have to deal with passports. We don't got to deal with all that other stuff. It's also a lot more expensive. So it's a lot cheaper for everybody involved to go to Yellowstone and we're hyped to do it because I want to see some bears, dude. That's what I'm saying. See some big rocks. I want to see some bears. I want to see salmon flying around, bears just grabbing salmon, eagles. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. So we're working with a company called Trova Trip and the way it works is they're helping us plan out this whole trip. It's going to be, I believe, four or five days. The cost is going to be, what, 2100-ish? Right around there that's right around the pocket and so the um the iceland trip was going to be a lot more expensive we wanted to keep it uh, a little bit more budget friendly for this first one and it's going to be an awesome creator trip you can see more information down in the description below so if you guys are interested in the middle of august and sending it out to yellowstone national park with the boys our first ever creator trip we want all the rocks involved um so we're super excited check out the information down below and um sign up for this trip we're it's, making dope stuff, yeah. dude. We're gonna we're gonna bring the cameras. We, we're gonna be camping. Yes. Dude. I, are you and you and I campers? <sighs> you know, I think I can rough it for a few days. We're roughing it out there with and, you guys, and we're gonna be with the rocks. So I'm gonna feel like I'm not in this, you know, alone. We're gonna yes. have a squad together. Um, I also want to say that in order to pay for the trip, they have a payment plan, mm. which is nice. The trip's gonna be in August. We have you have to be fully paid three months before the trip is happening. So what is that? If we work backwards, not good at math. July, June, May. Okay, so you have to be fully paid off um, by May to be going on this trip in August. May eighteenth. Yes, May eighteenth, and that allows you to like you know do a payment plan installment, so you don't have to pay the whole thing um, you know all at once, but. Um, yeah, I'm super excited. I'm pumped, dude. I can't wait to see you guys out there. I believe spots are limited. I don't think there's more than 12 or 15 people that are Something allowed to like come. Something like that, yeah. It's a small group. So we're going to be hanging out. We're going to be roughing it. You know, we're going to be sharing tents and stuff. It's going to yeah. be weird, dude. And we're going to be sharing advice. You guys can ask oh, us any questions. Any question. Um, and we're, we're excited. Give this, mullet advice. Yes. Tons of stuff to go over. But hey, without further ado, let's get into this episode. Boom. Let's go. Mitchell Mullins, give me the one-handed crack presented by Leisure Hydration. There you go. Right. Oh, you scare me. Wow, oh, put that oh, lid back, oh. baby. Wow, let's oh, see it. Oh, oh give me a spin. Want to give, show me you. Spin. give me a spin. Give me a spin. I see from oh, dude, oh, We got no. Mars on the can, yeah, dude. dude. Mitchell, 4-4, four, four, baby. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. Dude. You had it, dude. You had it. You really did. I'll beautiful. show you how to do it well. That's, That's how you do good. it really well. That was beautiful. Thank you, I didn't want to start on the thing. It was an interesting uh, funky, yeah. Now I we're had, just spraying Mitchell with the, yeah, no, Jesus the juice, Christ. dude. Jesus Christ, he's our guest. <laughs> it's not good. Dude, I'm cheers, hyped boys. to have you. Welcome. Cheers, cheers fellas. Thank cheers, you, guys. Cheers, I'm just cheers. so thirsty. I just want to drink these the whole time and they make me yeah. wait and drive me fucking nuts. We need like four of them, dude. <laughs> okay, hey, hyped to have you, man. I want to I wanna start off by saying um, I think you have some of the most talented work I've ever seen uh, that's been on our show. And I and I don't say it lightly. I didn't. It's like, it's it's some amazing storytelling. You have beautiful color, beautiful editing, beautiful directing. Now you're stepping into that. And I, I mean, I'm hyped to I'm hyped to have you here. So welcome. Yes. Thank dude. you, man. Yeah. That means a ton. I will say you're one of the few guests that I followed before. I followed oh. before we had you on the podcast. Oh. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because you make fucking the sick of shit. And yeah. it's a very That's inspiring. Report. So I, there's like some real... St- value there chase is Not also hype because you guys kind of have a similar haircut yeah dude you dude. got like a little baby mullet going dude this this mullet is a new thing yeah oh it's this new is, oh yeah how new like this is the first this is the longest it's ever been it looks is really this good this the first the public moment. outing i i think so yeah. <laughs> oh, <dude. laughs> or at least from these angles too like usually if you're yeah. a podcast it's like front on yeah right like a, uh-huh. a zoom or something but so they're really getting this to see is the full action 45 proper. degrees is the ideal mullet angle yeah <laughs> you know because you see the front you see the side save and then yeah yeah i mean we got you know this is this is mega mullet and this the is cut. what we need this is also potentially the first episode i think where you brought something 
Yes. To share. Oh, yes. What did you bring? I brought, I brought oh. gifts. This is a, a late Christmas. Oh, wow. Oh, so we got cool. inputs notebooks. Oh, for, oh dude. Wow. Thank okay. you, sir. Okay. You'll have to cut them open a little I'm bit. I'm so but, excited oh, wow. about this. So tell me, when did this idea come to fruition? I'll pass that around. It's actually... <laughs> oh, wow. I get a fucking card, too? Dude. The mind is the greatest tool we have. This is a beautiful touch. Oh, wow. You even got through. a design this is a great on the little inside. Package. This Did this yourself. Oh, yeah. 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 Dude. This whole first batch is self fulfilled. So wow. It's just me in my living room. Oh, my God. Packing gosh. them up. How fun. But, oh, yeah. Bang. Got the little card yeah. in there. So, Mitchell, tell me, tell me about making something physical like this. Because obviously, you do a ton of stuff digitally. Yeah. Making something physical is a. Yeah. Is a whole nother ball game. When did you get the idea for the notebook? The first idea was like two years ago. I was just toying around with the idea of what it would actually look like to make a physical product. Mm -hmm. And then, as we all know, the execution of something is a whole other story, mm -hmm. right? You go, oh, it's it's so easy to have an idea. And then we're like, oh, this would be great to do, great to do. And then all of a sudden you hit the wall of complexity like, oh, wait, wait, what? So, okay, I got to go find the manufacturer. I got to mm. figure out how this actually works from a business point of view. Yes. How to every step in the chain, which we could dive into later if you want. But yeah, it's really come together like this last year and finally got around to launching it just last week publicly on Instagram. I mean, it says premium notebook on yeah. here dude, and this it is premium. premium it's, expensive, fuck, dude. Dude. it's got black linen on the cover. Oh, we got wow. the pages are like a thick cardstock. If you ain't linen, you design. ain't linen. Yeah. Dude, so, <laughs> oh, I like that, Chase. I filled up I filled up about eight and I just yep. went back. I did digital for the whole last like two years, mm -hmm. but I switched back as of, as of the new year. So thank you for, you know, adding this one to the deck. This is going to be yeah, awesome. Man. Dude, this is great. Yeah, this is yeah, beautiful. This is sick. I've I'm always gonna used the, I'm gonna a the people on YouTube oh, so they yeah. can see. Yep. But a bang. Got clean. <sighs> got the filthy so graphic you, design. So you've always been into journaling or no? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's always been, for me, it's more just like writing ideas and like mm. putting tasks down somewhere so I don't really have to think about them. But uh, like I've always used the Moleskin notebooks. That's and it. I, okay. And I yeah. love them and they're like, they're great. But when I went to designing this one, I was like, what do I actually want? I just want lines. I just want space to think. I don't want a calendar. I don't want these prompts in the beginning. I don't. It's not a mindfulness journal. I just want space for ideas. So I took all that out. There's like two brand pages, and then it's just straight minimal lines, black and white, all the way through. And so, you come up with thing. the idea. You're like, I want to make a journal. What is like the very first step? And then like, what's the process of like, you come up with the idea, and like now we're holding the physical product in our hands. I started looking for inspiration. Okay. Right. You go online, just like a project or anything. It's it's all the same as anything else. You go up, you look, you know, where what are other notebooks look like? What are some like kind of the edgier looking notebooks? What are like, you know, there's the big the big leather folded ones you could get at Barnes and Noble or anything like that. And then you narrow down what do you like? It's like what's the style for this piece? I always say like your style is your preference. And so whenever you have a bunch of you know, inputs or inspirations on the board in front of you, you can kind of pick and choose and go, well, if I was to make something, I would want it to be like this, or I'd want it to look like this. And so all of a sudden you start narrowing down your scope of here. The, the, what if we design something that has this kind of edginess to it, this kind of like brutalist graphic design, and then it's just this simple. And that's where you start. And then how many versions did you create before landing on the final product? I think it was like six or seven different versions and different versions from like a graphic design sense. There was a bunch of material samples from the manufacturer. The like boxes was like, even the boxes, I got the first one, I was like, nope, garbage instantly. I was like, this is not it, wrong material, all this stuff. And it turns out it's really hard to print white on corrugated cardboard. It's like a whole oh. process. It's like, you would think it'd be so simple if you, if you print it in black, yeah. oh my God easiest thing in the world you want white no so sir make, make a white notebook yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For your first one. That's there, funny. there's a lot of design decisions that are so much more complex than you would think they'd be and then it's not until you dive into the weeds and you're like oh my god i gotta figure this out this out and this out but then on the other side of it you look back and you go oh my god i have this product that i yeah. made with my own hands you know it's it's a beautiful thing from start to finish you know till we physically got your your let's go the last version that you loved mm -hmm. how long was that period of time the last version so they were actually manufactured in last july oh, wow. so i got them in august and they've just been sitting in my office since august and planned a, a couple content shoots and different things for it and like getting images up on the website shopify the email flows the oh my god like just it's like an endless amount of things like an endless checklist um 
and then got super busy at the end of last year with a ton of productions and then coming out this year i was like this has got to come out <laughs> like, as soon as possible so so you yeah. you had our, our boy arthur para helped you oh, yeah. he was he was the model for mm-hmm. one of the one of the spots that i saw uh, how long did did that piece of content take because it's not just like you you grabbed it and with your iphone you're like it's out you made this elaborate you know you know, product video that yeah. could go it could go on the screen it's crazy you know? i will say when i was scrolling through tiktok i had read the caption underneath it and i was like oh arthur's in like a sick commercial I'm like <laughs> dude he banged the like big commercial i know he acted and then i was watching then i read it, i was like oh shit it's a notebook yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean well what's funny is because i don't know if many people know but arthur and i used to live together that yes. was our with we, dylan yeah with dylan mm-hmm. he we all moved into a, a three-bedroom spot which i still live there now okay um but arthur before he had moved out we were throwing ideas back and forth for physical products and we were just like, you know, chatting ideas and all this stuff. And I had mentioned the notebook to him. He's like, dude, that's a really sick idea. Like that, that would be something worth doing. And then, uh, whenever we were getting samples and different things back, I was like, yo, we should just do a shoot. I just want to test something out. We should hang out like whatever. And we literally just hung out for an afternoon and shot it and then chill the rest of the day. So (laughs) that was literally that. No way. You shot that like little commercial in the afternoon. No, no. So just, just the section with Arthur. Oh, okay. Okay. And then everything else was kind of like spread out. Uh And then, yeah, we shot one thing like a couple days before the actual launch video came out. And then that was like me packaging up all the stuff and you know how it is. (laughs) Yeah. And so now that you have, you know, the physical product done, marketing comes into play. Mm -hmm. What's your plan for that? How do you get it? Like, how do you plan on selling it basically and like getting it in the hands of uh, the consumer? Yeah, so there's a couple phases in my mind. This first one was, you know, your organic audience can only take you so far. The goal for these notebooks isn't to just blast my audience into eternity (laughs) to have every, every follower buy a notebook. I, I think for me, it was more of just a fulfilling thing to put out a piece I was excited about for my audience is kind of just like, a, a creative next step of, or just an evolution of this project to put it out. Here's this piece that I can use and leverage. But then the next phase that I'm stepping into now is getting it into other people's hands that have never seen it, getting fresh eyes, either running advertisements, just doing organic stuff on social, um, running the Instagram page, doing stuff like that, or even just word of mouth. I think with a notebook, it's beautiful that you can have a product out there that people take around. They see their friends see, you know, if you're creative, everyone you know most likely is a creative or is going to see the the things that you bring around and the gear you have so that's kind of the next step and and i'm willing to just grow with it and see what happens to it you know i really have no expectations it's really just we've got a couple plans in place and how i kind of want to structure the next couple months but then you know it's up to the market to to see how they really want it do you have other products in the pipeline that are along this series or is it just kind of the journal and you're going to move on to another thing yeah, there, there's a couple of products in the pipeline, more just variations of the notebook up front. I have a couple other more grand ideas that I could navigate inputs either through digital or, or different physical mediums. But at the moment, I want to just front run it with a, a flagship product. Wow, I'm, I'm excited. I, mean, I also appreciate quality. how it's not too thick. The moleskin yeah. one I've tried. Yeah. Yeah. And when, you're, when your wrist is too high off the table, mm-hmm. like you can't write as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, that's just how I there, think. There's little decisions from like, a decade of using moleskins where I'm like, okay, I, I hate the soft cover ones. I throw it in my bag, you throw in a camera, it gets smashed or like the pages or whatever. And so I'm like, I want the band. I want like a hardcover notebook and then just nothing in it but lines to use. Yeah. So it's like, it's pretty simple when you think about it, but actually making one, whole other story. But, Dude, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. you, you make a lot of stuff. You don't just make notebooks. Right. We, saw, <laughs> we, we, we saw that you made a really cool spot uh, with Rivian. And it was a spec piece, right? Yes. So yes. Talk, talk to me when you got the idea for for this shoot because there's so many cool assets that ended up coming out of it. It looks it looks like it could be like the trailer for Dune, the Dune two. <laughs> right. I mean, they, they need to, they need to call you guys to get right. you guys back out to use the Rivian because it was awesome. So tell me tell me about this shoot. How did it come to life? So this shoot, the original conception of it was so I co-directed it with Nick Dean. I don't know if you guys know him or friends like with a him. Friend of a friend. Yeah, he's um. He, he's a legend in the automotive space. Like he's, he's been stepping into directing, coming from like a DP past like background and he's been crushing in the automotive space and, and we've become friends over the past couple of years. And we were having a conversation over breakfast one day and we were like, dude, why don't we kind of just combine our superpowers into something? You know, he was like, I really want to make more automotive work and kind of push the boundaries on it. My background and expertise in in directing or filmmaking is kind of like building building worlds and building these kind of like these characters and kind of really grand scenes. And we were like, dude, why, why don't we do something together? 
and it took on a lot of different shapes and forms. Like originally it was going to be the short film and we had pitched it to a couple companies and had a few leads and then it fell off. We were like, okay, let's chop it down. We'll make a spec ad commercial or something, whatever. And at the end of the day, we were like, do we actually believe in this idea or is this something we want to just move on from? And we were like, I think this idea is worth doing even if we fund it ourselves. And so we were like, what would this actually cost? We put it all together, you know, reached out. We got a DP on board. We got a producer on board, everyone that wanted to be a part of the project. And then we ultimately just pulled the trigger on it. And so up front for us, it wasn't necessarily important that it was a Rivian because not many people know, but it was originally supposed to be a Hummer EV ad. Hmm. And then we hit a snag and there's no Hummer EVs that you can find anywhere. <laughs> they don't exist. It's not a thing. No. <laughs> we, we, we know well about trying to get cars. For yeah. <laughs> electric ones. Uh, electric, electric cars are, can be a pain in the They're ass. They're very difficult to source. And so this was a decision like weeks before the shoot. We had everything planned out. It was all based around these couple core concepts. It was like we had the scene in the warehouse. We had the running footage in the desert, like car to car action. And we were like, dude, what if we did a Rivian? That'd be sick. Let's just do a Rivian. And we were actually going to do the Rivian SUV. And then two days before, the plans changed something, and we just went with the R1T, which is their truck model. And so we put there, and we're like, dude, it doesn't matter. It's all the same. <laughs> right. <laughs> the concept doesn't change. It's great. Let's put it in there. It's electric. We can base all our ideas off of this. And then we just ran it with the R1T. So yeah, we, we jumped into the project kind of head first, and we were like, let's get this first big scene out of the way, like the car reveal, because that's what we were most excited about. We were like, if this idea is worth doing, let's do the stuff we think is going to make the biggest impact, and then going out into the desert and doing running car footage and stuff, like that's Nick's expertise, and like we can we can lean on that, and that's what we did. You must have had a storyboard for, or a shot list, right? Mm. When you go out to the desert, is it just like, let's do our thing and just like shoot a bunch of stuff and like it comes together in the edit or like how much of it is like following the shot list storyboard versus let's just have some fun. It's a little bit of both. Okay. So the the two specific kind of types of shots we're going to get is hard mounts and running footage, which is like car to car with a black arm. You have like the huge rig running next Looks to the so car. Sick. He, Dude, he, he, so he, much he just had, he had one in the garage. <laughs> oh, yeah, actually, yeah. <laughs> no, no, that's, no. <laughs> that's amazing. The no. Ukraine, we call it now. Not the, what, no, you said black arm, right? Black arm, they used black to call arm. it the Russian arm. There's the Russian arm. Call, <laughs> <laughs> call it the Ukraine, which yeah. is better. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, that's like what they call it. But anyways, <laughs> keep going. Our, the uh, the DP on the project, Mason Printer Gas, he's he's got one built out on his on his Forerunner, which is just his unreal. stuff's incredible. Dude, that's he's, sick. He's a legend, for real. For yeah. real. and uh, he was so willing to jump on this project and just like take it to that next level too. So when we were out in the desert, we we had a guy specifically come out just to mount the car for the entire day. It was like we had a key, we got a key grip who's just like his his like. On sets, he just sits there and builds stuff for the car to mount, and he knew every mount that we wanted, and he just sat there out in the desert heat building these these rigs. And then when it came time for sunset, Mason, Nick, and I had put together a plan like, okay, we want you know they call it like a joust, or or we're doing like following footage, or we're gonna have like the car rip around in front and stuff like that. So there was a little bit of like impromptu action kind of happening, but for the most part, and this is where I was really leaning on Nick and Mason's expertise because I've never shot car stuff before this and I was a little nervous going into it you know it's like yeah I like I felt very comfortable in every other part of the process and I was like I feel so out of my league here and literally within 30 minutes of us shooting stuff I was like this is the funnest thing ever dude like I, I want to do this again so you want to do more car stuff yeah yeah I, I mean like, Chase crushes the yeah. car That's stuff I, yeah, yeah. It's a little car stuff <laughs> <laughs> but anyways let's get into the minutia of like Fucking some yeah. shots. Yeah. Okay, wait, so wait, like the wait, car everyone, everyone before shot. Before shot. Can I ask him how much how much money did you guys have to put up for for this project? So I think we landed close. To, we're still actually finishing all the financials. Oh, wow. so okay. Each other. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I bought in and out. You fucker. <laughs> <laughs> oh just, just for production expenses, I think Nick and I put up fifteen. Wow. For it, which Each is or total, total, okay. Okay. which is for a spec piece. Yeah. For you know, I mean, this is this is pretty good. It's for yeah. what it was gonna That's be. pretty insane. That's actually. awesome, dude. I yeah. think if you told like a, a Rivian or like a client that you could make that for fifteen grand, they would shit their pants. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that is insane. Yeah. That's so impressive, and that's, and that's one of the beautiful things to leverage with spec pieces is you can go out and create a piece like this. You can kind of put the stake in the ground further than where you already have it, and then you can go up and oh, hey, you know, we're capable of shooting a 150K spot or a 300 or half a million dollar spot. And all of a sudden, 
all your investment was just this, like a fraction of that to go into it. And so it's just a beautiful thing that we can leverage in so many different ways. And, you know, whether that be a car commercial or, you know, even talking with other agencies about other creative work and different things, like it, having those kind of like next level pieces, people just take you more seriously and you, I don't know, just open so many doors for real. Okay. You guys know. Go, sorry, so like Chase. the car reveal, there's all these yeah. people in like hoods walking and yep. there's like, so there's like, and then you get a lot of depth going, are you, do you have like 20 extras like wearing hoods or yeah. like? Yeah. So yeah. those were actually, um, Nick, Nick and I put out a thing on our Instagram story it was like hey does anyone want to come out like we'll buy you guys dinner and we just got chipotle for everybody <laughs> genius is that like a warehouse like yeah they just showed something? up in downtown la yeah they we're like we're like shooting in another part of the warehouse and then a producer comes in he's like hey guys are we wrapping the scene up soon like we, we have 20 people downstairs <laughs> <We're> like, waiting <laughs> they don't know what's happening and we're like yeah 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 we'll be done soon and then he's like okay good food just came in they're all occupied for a while and then we came down there i i knew all these people too mm, like right. they were friends and stuff <laughs> how'd you have the idea for that because you have like the car lights coming through there's obviously like haze and mm -hmm. and then you're just like we just need some like ghouls walking towards the car it looks so cool it makes it look so sick i'm like so stuck on it but like how'd you come up with that idea yeah so originally this is one of the things too about just being kind of nimble with the creative process and being able to kind of morph your ideas as they happen because so originally like i was saying the the rivian piece was this short film idea originally about this this is like the whole other tangent here but it was about like this mom and this daughter and like the connection with this motorcycle and all this stuff that got watered down into not watered down but changed into this piece and the warehouse scene actually had a lot bigger part of that story than it did in our piece and kind of our anchor coming into this project we were most excited to shoot that because our original character in the film was going to come in this was like the valley of death kind of like facing the fears moment before like letting it rip on the on the motorbike and even on set nick and i were like oh dude d does this make as much sense as we thought it did and we're like I it's fine like it looks great it looks cool this can kind of be a more abstract moment you know in the middle of all this chaos he kind of gets teleported and put into this you know whatever like objectively i these figures don't show up in any other part of the piece but it's one of those things is just it's how it was and you know, it's a cool it's a cool show yeah <laughs> that, honest, well, that's, you know? in my head i'm like yeah. it's visually so sick that i don't i, mm -hmm. I mean i don't that's all i'm focused on i'm mm -hmm. not even wondering if it made sense i just thought that's fucking cool <laughs> Dude, you know you can just put up anything cool on right. Instagram. it doesn't have to have any context <laughs> like, yeah, the cooler crazy. it looks like the less then, it needs to make yeah. sense yeah oh yeah exactly i was like i was i remember thinking like, i don't know how this fits but i like it so much <laughs> yeah. that no one is gonna ever care what is, that's cool. so funny what did you guys shoot it on we shot on the alexa mini lf oh wow Classic. okay with some, some tribe seven blackwing lenses which is <laughs> so so pretty. <laughs> How, good. How'd you do like the city and the mirage kind of broke rumbling city effect? Is so that... so there was like which one which one like the there's wides of like a there's multiple there's multiple there's like <laughs> wides of like a city that's like crumbling in the desert kind yep, of yep yeah okay so it, this is actually a great question so there's two different <laughs> two different types of cities one is the the city that's in the background of all yes. the shots I just composited in there we we had well let me say this so we actually had an unreal engine artist build a full city for some of the running footage when the car blasts oh, out of crazy. the warehouse which is a whole other mission oh my god <laughs> just to get a city done um we had a, a friend of mine a really talented artist alex hooker made this city he spent like a week or two just building out the little intricate details and like texturing the car and like all these things and then when it came time to actually edit the piece together we had these beautiful shots, but all of a sudden we have our character out in, out in the desert. And I'm like, this would make sense if the city was in the back here. Do you mind rendering just like a profile view of the city you built? And so he just rendered out this like 12K image and I just went and comped it in to every scene, so. And is that in After Effects? Yeah, yeah, in After okay. Effects. So it was just a lot of like, it, I had to send off some of the clips to get motion tracked and then they'll send you back an After Effects file and you can kind of just lay things in where you want and then I'll just like mask out, you know, gotcha. if you want to like do whatever. That's so nice. We, so we were joking around. I was like, Brayden, can you go on Rivian's Instagram and like see what their branding's like? I wanted to see if your <laughs> ad was like similar <laughs> to their branding and it's not. And it's not. I bring that up to say, when we give kids the advice or people that listen to this podcast the advice of, hey, when you go to make a spec ad, it's probably smart to make it on brand because then you get 
Like you don't want to make a spec piece that doesn't necessarily feel like the so branding there, yeah. of the brand you're, you know, making a spec piece for. Mm-hmm. But when it's as sick as yours, like I almost feel like it doesn't matter. So you kind of brought up that you were like, it was going to be a Hummer, then it was a Rivian. Like the car brand doesn't necessarily matter. Was the end goal for the spec ad to just show off what you guys can make with a certain amount of budget to then pitch and get a larger budget? Yeah, yeah. So it, it was really just to, I mean, one, we just want to pour our hearts into something sure. to make it exciting. And, you know, of all the work last year, that was definitely the most fulfilling project. So there, there's that aspect creatively. But then, yeah, it's really just to start conversations. You know, we, we've been reaching out with Rivian and there's a couple conversations here and there different car brands and stuff trying to see where we can fit it in but it's funny you bring that up because that was actually one of our intentions from the beginning is we were like what are some of the things that you would classically expect in a car ad and then how can we do them totally wrong so like do it like so for instance the first time we see the car it's covered in dust we actually went and bought 20 gallons of movie dust and we have a guy sitting down there for like an hour with this little machine this crank machine and it's just blasting this car with dust and you would expect in a car ad to see this beautiful pristine like you know every detail's polished and our car looks like it sat there for 100 years <laughs> so it's just doing it all wrong but for the right reasons and it, it really came out i think genius after you guys finished how many shoot days did you have after the desert was that just one day so the shoot was three days total like okay actual shooting the warehouse scene was an entire day which you know there's days before and after like the uh, finishing everything um but then the the main running footage we had was one entire day like traveling out there one full shoot day and then come back and then the last scene was just a sunrise okay. where he was like out in the desert from from being with a guy like nick and seeing all of this and crazy car stuff on set what did you take away the most from actually physically filming cars that you can now bring in to the next car shoot if you uh if you do if you do one in the future i i'd say it's just the way that the entire crew was thinking about angles right where there's just there's such a mindfulness for how the energy is impacting each shot, right? If you're if you're driving straight at the car, you're getting these quick little like the car's in and out in half a second. That shot only has so much utility in an edit, right? Whereas then you have these like beautiful long tracking shots. And I think maybe one really important point here is is Nick and I were talking about as a director, one of the most powerful things you can do is just be confident and just hold on a shot. And just hold, 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 hold. And so we were switching between these really fast shots that build energy and these other shots that we were just living in and just sitting there and we we're like, this is beautiful. Hold, hold, hold. And it's like a seven second shot. And so rarely do we do we put seven second clips in a, in a video, you know, so. I mean, one of those was the FPV. Sh- was it an FPV? Is Vito just fucking ripping the one where it's like far away and the car's going like, looks like it's going 100 miles an hour. Oh, and then yeah. the, the, the drone gets so fucking close i was like <laughs> how did you not crash yeah but i Th- mean that one was actually so we had Vito on the warehouse day and then roddy uh, uh is one of mason's really close friends he came out and shot drone on the project gotcha. and he got so close to the car. was he was he was he, did he strap a komodo to it or what did they do or it was just, just inspired too oh just oh, oh just wow. the inspired yeah, but it's like dual op so it's just oh, it kind of gave it more of that crazy motion and we gotcha. like unlocked the z-axis gotcha so all of a sudden we get that roll oh and everything. cool yeah. i mean that <laughs> shot is so sick <laughs> just through the window of the rivian <laughs> that, that's what i would have done right yeah, yeah. what i sent it through the window of the rivian so it has like the sci-fi otherworldly feel you told us in the in the form that you're super inspired by like Star Wars and when you were six, you wanted to recreate Star Wars scenes yeah. with your brother. Has that been just a, a point of inspiration throughout your career of wanting to make that type of vibe of videos and content? It's funny you bring that up. I, I put that on the form. There was like, it was like, what was the original thing that you got inspired sure. for filmmaking? And just to give a little backstory here, Uh, when I was younger, my brother and I were obsessed with Star Wars. I have a younger brother, like two and a half years younger. And uh, we watched Star Wars like every day. It was like our thing. And one day I was like, I really want to try to recreate some of these scenes. And we'd set them up and he would run in and we'd try to block out the way, mimic what the characters are doing and stuff. And um, that that was like the earliest I'd ever picked up a camera. But I'm I'm sure that influence is there. I think there's that like sci-fi otherworldly aspect, but it's also partly just what I'm drawn to, I feel like the you know when i'm thinking of ideas or at least like the the lane of thinking that i've been in with a lot of projects that have really excited me it's been like 
oh, cool, let's utilize, you know, our skills in VFX or with uh, with filmmaking or with FPV or these different things. And I, f- I feel like it always culminates to this just kind of otherworldly place. You know, you're like, yeah. oh, that rock is floating. Like, this is like, it, it, I don't know. I, th- <laughs> I think of Michael Scott in the office <laughs> taking improv classes and in every scene he brings out the gun oh, and yeah. it's like if you yeah. have like yeah. a lightsaber in every piece right. you're like you know, like you did the new balance commercial yeah. it's like oh, dude we need a lightsaber right. in here like <laughs> somehow be funny funny dude i i feel like you brought something up where most creative people that we talk to here that we know they usually do one thing okay like mm-hmm. they'll either be a director photo drone you do everything and you don't just do everything you do everything really fucking good Mm -hmm. so how how did you balance um you know what like when you started you're obviously you're just making stuff you learn how to edit learning how to shoot uh, and you're you're pulling all these different things into your arsenal like you can open after effects and use it really well and comp images in you can fly a drone really fucking well you can Mm -hmm. shoot really well now you're even stepping away from a lot of that and directing right so uh, how how did you decide what you wanted to pick up and how did you decide eventually what you wanted to say goodbye to? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. I, it's not always practical, but I feel like the answer is curiosity, mm-hmm. right? Like throughout this, you know, I've been freelancing like full time for about seven plus years now. And it's taken on so many different forms for me. Like you were just talking about is like originally I started out doing fitness content and then it was, you know, okay, we're going to be a travel filmmaker and we're going to fly FPV now and different things. And a lot of the, a lot of the things that got me into those lanes was really just curiosity. I saw something and I wanted to learn about it and step into it. I do think, you know, from a, from a business or even just like a, a practical filmmaking approach, you, you can't do everything. You know, you can't do everything all the time. You can't be the filmmaker. You're, you can't be the director. You can't be the FPV pilot. You know, unless you're shooting a one-man band project and it's, you're off doing a freelance gig. You or hire something. Mitchell. He just rolls up like goggles on. <laughs> yeah, we got red, red on the shoulder. He's like, I'm ready. Yeah. Goggles. Like, we're, <laughs> boom mic. <laughs> we're driving the car. We got yeah. yeah. Every, he's got the crane arm thing, dude. He's yeah. like, I'm. <laughs> he's like, turns his hat to the side. <laughs> got it all going. But. I, <laughs> <laughs> you've got three fpv goggles yeah. on <laughs> you're like they call you on one phone you have a second one you're like one second <laughs> hold on <laughs> the guys. producer <laughs> but i i think looking back at it the culmination of all those skills is i think what i'm most proud of as far as like you take a little bit from everything so you have okay, the way that we move the camera with the FPV, okay, the technicality of VFX work or color grading or different things. And it's not that, you know, the goal is to be doing those things at a high level all the time. It's, there's so many other people that are so much better at being a DP, at being a colorist, sound designer, whatever. And at some degree with bigger production, you do have to let go of these elements and let the experts do their thing. Um, But having that background and having that knowledge at least in the work I've done has been so invaluable. And it's something that I, it's, I think it's sad to see some people neglect the curiosity to, to, you know, not everyone needs to do everything, but I do think that there's a lot of value in staying curious and learning new things, no matter what you're doing, even if it's, you know, you're interested in science or you're interested in computer programming or coding or something. They, all of those things, it's all interconnected. Like there, there's skills to take from every discipline that you can apply to anything else, you know, podcasting or just learning how to speak and social media. Like you guys would agree. It's all the same thing mm-hmm. at the end of the day, as far as, you know, taking and applying those skills. So that is where I kind of see that. And at least going forward, it's just staying curious, but knowing, okay, this, this is the direction I want to go. And so far directing has given me that outlet to express myself in all those ways so yeah I'm, i mean i'm excited to see what you continue to direct mm-hmm. and so this was the spot that was for blue hour what is blue hour the rivian piece yeah right so so the rivian piece was actually in collaboration with alto it's oh, a production okay. company here but yes a lot of the production work i do is with blue hour blue hour is a well it's it's run by two of my super close friends chris roller and alex broadstock uh it's a production company out of new york and I've just been on the ground with them since the beginning. You know, we put out a reel a couple years ago, launching the the guys launched the company, and we've the the clients and the work that we've been able to bring in and kind of set that standard for creativity and be more of like a boutique 
production house has been such a journey and it's it's been growing like crazy so the reel you guys made for blue hour is unlike a reel i've seen from a production company Mm. you had like a narrative aspect to it it (laughs) wasn't just like let me get a sick instrumental and show you all my best shots like how did you guys pull that off? I think I think Chris was the one that found the narrative. It's like a it's like a French yeah. old French TV show, I believe. And the amount of times we repeated all the, <laughs> the French sex over and over and over. Um, but it was one of those things where you're just like, this feels so native. This feels perfect for what we're going for, and it yeah. felt so different. And you know the the inception of the company and and all the work we were trying to create, it did have that moody aesthetic yeah. to it. It's, you know, blue hour at the heart is like, you know, the dusk, the the really kind of gritty, had a gritty nature to it. Yeah. And um, yeah, I, I think a lot of things just natively aligned when that came out, for real. Have you been with them since day one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I was on a project with Alex in Dubai early 2019, I think. And we, we, we just, well, we'd never known each other before this. We got put on this project together. We just, we literally landed and within a few minutes we're like, dude, I feel like we're going to be really good friends. We're like, (laughs) like, like, this is, this is great. I'm so excited to be here. (laughs) And then we've just fostered that, that relationship since then. And, And Alex and I have collaborated on a lot of pieces. And that's another thing with Blue Hours collaboration has always been at the heart of all the work that we do. And yeah, I'm, I'm just excited to see it grow and a lot of big stuff. So. And for that, for Blue Hour, these projects, are you leaning more into the directing side of things or are you still DPing and flying drones and doing the whole thing? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there's a mix. Um, so personally right now, it's I'd say about half the work I do is with Blue Hour and then half the work I do is just independent contracting work. Gotcha. Everything I've been trying to do is directing and I'd say most of the projects that come in are for directing, but every now and then you have the freelance gig where it's might require you to do both, right? Yeah. If you're um, like, we did a project recently last November to end the year and we went down to Brazil and Bolivia and Alex and I took that project on and it required us to both direct and DP at the same time. It was like, we need a two camera setup, super lean team. And that's another beautiful thing that we've been able to, to work on at Blue Hour is is creating these big, big budget commercials with a really lean team. And when I mean lean, I mean like eight to ten people. More bags, baby. Right? Yeah, 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 for exactly. sure. Yeah, there's a lot of, but also from a, <laughs> also from like a creative point of view, right? right? Like if you have thirty people on set, oh, yeah. like it, not much gets bought. You know, it, it's very like regulated and kind of strict. And you know, it's like there's only so many creative ideas that can make it to the table. Mm-hmm. But when you have a leaner team and everyone's on the same page, it's a beautiful thing. What did Tej say? He said, small team, big checks. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're on in 2024. Yeah. Small, small team, team. Yeah. <laughs> big checks. That's funny. When you're doing freelance, right? Um, a big thing is consistent income because you have to pay bills, right? Yes. And I feel like as a photographer or videographer, it's maybe like I don't direct, so I'm not exactly sure. But as a photographer, videographer, it's maybe a little bit easier to get like retainer gigs mm. of like, hey, I can do social media content and I know that I have, you know, three, four thousand dollars coming in uh, every month because of this retainer client. Mm-hmm. How does it work in the directing space? Um, are you just completely freelance and you're just like, you know, I hope a uh, a new project comes in my inbox this like this morning or is there ways to have quote unquote retainer clients as a director yeah i mean so a lot of the work that i do on my own independent contractor it is kind of just a one by one you know project comes in okay you know out of the cold like you know let's go direct this or or shoot this or whatever yeah but a lot of that consistency i believe is solved by either working closely with a production house or, you know, if you're close with the agency or something, you know, you have friends there. You have people that you trust and they trust you to and your creative vision to, to bring it to life. You know, uh, thank, thankfully, Blue Hour has a, a huge influx of work. And so it's kind of an all hands on deck um, approach to it. And, you know, whenever we're we're all focused, uh, there's plenty of work to go around. I'll just say it that way. Gotcha. You know, so I, I think it can be a little more difficult if you're just solely a freelance. Yeah director for say because things could be a little more sporadic and like all over the place but yeah that that for me has kind of been the balance between gotcha. between the two but you know some guys are only with a production house or like a, a lot of production houses will sign directors or they'll have multiple production houses they're signed with but yeah yeah makes sense what are what are projects that you say no to slash mm. do you 
That's a good question. I feel like a lot of the times when I say no to stuff, it's not necessarily because it's a specific project. It's more like a timing thing. Mm. Like these projects, and this has been a big shift for me too in the last couple of years where the projects have gotten bigger and bigger, but they also take longer and longer. And so you have these like, like for instance, October, November, and the beginning of December was completely blocked off for one project. And That's awesome. Which mm-hmm. is crazy, right? So there's also that consistency, Yeah. but anything that comes in, it's not like, oh, I don't work on that or I don't do this. Or it, sometimes, you know, if it's like a lower hanging fruit thing, you could say no to it. Right. But, um, but yeah, that's, that has also played a lot into the consistency factor where it's like these things take so long to do and there's there's really only so many projects you can fit in per year. And when you have that many days on the clock, you know, you're not as worried about the consistency of them for sure. You're talking about working on these bigger projects. Um, I want to get into the eventually the travel influencer stuff that you mm, were doing because yeah. that stuff's awesome. Advice for going from creating maybe more social media type of content to directing these big pieces um have you gotten advice from your roommate dylan and like do you have advice for you know going from maybe smaller budget stuff to directing these bigger pieces yeah i mean personally that journey for me a lot of it has been just kind of trusting in yourself with it because there's a lot of big question marks as you try to make a bigger piece or like oh what am i doing is this or is this commercial done the right way am i doing this or that and i i don't think there's any wrong answers you know i think if you have an objective and a goal of, you know, okay, I want to make this piece or I want to make this spec piece or doing something, just do it. It, it doesn't have to be the grandest, biggest project of your life. It, it Just make something that excites you. And I think the pieces start to fall in place as you put the work out. And so it's like, you know, looking back, actually doing some of these spec pieces along the way, there's like, oh my God, like, what am I doing? Like, oh, I've been, this is like a passion project, this and this. And then all of a sudden you stack up all these projects in a row and you're like, this is what I do now. And it's kind of, you'd be the same thing for like getting into social media work or doing anything. You know, someone has that, that threshold where they're like, oh man, I'm on the other side of it. I don't, I've never made social content before. I've never been a, or ran a podcast or done anything like this. And then you start doing it and all of a sudden that's the thing you do, you know? So I, I'd say it's the same as anything else, but you, there, there's definitely a lot of uh, trust in your, in your abilities, you know? You just gotta, you just gotta put it out there. And even if you're scared to do something or you're, you know, you're nervous or you don't know, you know, don't know how to film car commercials. Well, there's plenty of people that do. And I'm sure, you know, they, they would love to make something with you too. So yeah, totally. You talk a lot about how, you know, you've had like leaner crews on, on some of these shoots. You went down to South America, really lean crew, two people. How can people specifically, a lot of the people starting out, they might be one man band, two people, maybe even three. How do you or how do you assure that you have the most successful product at the end? And what are some things that you've you know you found working with smaller teams of two, threes, fours? Um, you know, because some of these people might not have like the network that we we all have. They might not have ten people they can call to like get onto a set. So you know, you've executed a really high level with you know two of you, three of you. Uh, what kind of advice do you have to people going at shoots like that? To yeah, be and and what. What exactly do you mean by successful? Like, like I mean, come out with the best possible product. How, what things to not make mistakes on when you mm-hmm. have like such a small team of people, but like you guys make awesome stuff. So you know what what goes into the pre production or in post that you see that you're like, oh, like this is what we're doing differently that I don't see others doing. Mm. I I mean, it kind of goes back to the the skill stacking aspect of it, right? Like when everyone on your team is like a multidisciplinary filmmaker and they're good at this and this and this, you have all your bases covered. Whereas if you just had two guys that were strictly camera operators and they need to fulfill a directing role at some points or a producing role or even to be an editor and know, like, see the edit coming together as it's happening. Like when Alex and I were shooting this piece, we're we're filming these interviews over on this like cliffside and they would like say these one liners, boom, boom, boom. We just look at each other. We're like, that was the that was the shot that goes in there. We're kind of like seeing it all the way through to the end. And I think that comes from just having people that are they're multidisciplinary artists in all different types of ways. So Mm -hmm. like, you know, not everyone has, you know, resources like that to, you know, if you're hiring on a crew or very specific positions, but it, that, that for us has really made the difference when, you know, you can see it, you can see it through to the end and I can see it through to the end too. And then you make magic. So what have you learned from more of a business standpoint, uh, in the creative space? I feel like that is where a lot of people lack in like, I, you, you, you hear the thing all the time. People are like, oh, we don't want to be like a starving artist. And I feel mm-hmm. like that comes from 
uh, just being so wrapped up in the work and not understanding that, wow, you, you still, you have to sell yourself. You have to sell your work. That's like, that's the way you get work. You get bid by five different companies that are trying to sell this specific yeah. spot. Uh, what have you learned during that process from transitioning to travel filmmaker to now working with Blue Hour, working on your own stuff? Yeah, I, I kind of feel like, I mean, I've been out here in Los Angeles for about seven years now and I had originally left school to come out here or like I had some friends out here and came out here. I was like, let's try freelancing for a little bit. We can always go back, you know, and whatnot. And I kind of feel like I learned the business part of things the hard way. I feel like I had almost no experience going into it. And it was something that I completely overlooked for a long time where I was like, you know, the work will speak for itself. This will do that. You know, I, if I'm just good enough at this, it'll, it'll be this, or we'll do these projects or this spec piece and it'll all come together. When in reality, there's there's so many systems that have to be in place in the background and 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 knowledge and and proper judgment for every step of the way. I I think for me the biggest thing that's moved the needle forward is just being around other people that have been in it in the game longer, and you instantly see, oh, that's how they're doing things. Oh my god, that makes so much sense. Oh wow, okay, I see how Costas has put put his financial stuff together or the contracts together, and like, oh, you have a team for this that's crazy. You know, like what, like, Oh, okay. And I feel like a lot of those things, when you get around other people that have more experience, things just start to make more sense. And so then from the business side of things, you know, you go, Oh, well, it's not just let me make work and put out a portfolio. And then that's all the value I provide. It's like, no, no, no. Like each client, like there's value that you can bring to them. There's value that you can offer to them, that you can pitch, that you can increase the value of their creative. Like there's, there's so many different avenues that you could take in selling your work. And I think one one thing for me is just trying to take more pride in selling it. Because if it's something you truly believe in, it 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 shouldn't be difficult to sell, right? If you're like, this, you know, this is something that I'm truly passionate about and it's gonna provide an immense amount of value for you, there's no selling. There's no like cheap, oh, gotcha, you know, this, that. It's like, you can offer real value to the world. And I think, having a medium to do that and a skill that all of us can can come together on like that is just amazing one of the skills you have that brings people together is djing so is <laughs> is, is is the natural progression you know dp director then full-time dj well i was gonna get to that uh, <laughs> yeah so <laughs> do you want to give him some back some context here so mitchell rips oh okay. well okay. And i don't know if, i don't know if you rips. knew this but i used to dj do you? Oh, I'm retired okay. now, but um, <laughs> I think we should get you in like the LA scene, little like Bootsy Bellows hide yeah, action, dude. Um, Saturday nights. I'm here for it. We <laughs> I know some promoters here to get you plugged in. <laughs> we we've been throwing these parties in the desert like yeah. every year now for years, and Costas actually came out to one of the last ones. I've been to one and uh, haven't been haven't, since. Haven't been invited. <laughs> haven't been invited. <laughs> It keeps happening where the male defy it just keeps yeah. kind of missing him yeah. for stuff. Yeah. Mm. Nate, Nate mm. invited me to the last he one. Did. It's kind of on Instagram. I mean, we saw how Costas acted the last one. Right? Yes, right. it was pretty right. You saw I wasn't going to bring it up, but you know, we yeah. 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 You got, you got he's him. DJ's, yeah. when, you're, <laughs> when you're doing the list. I got escorted out of Alabama Hills. Yeah, security, dude. Yeah, their team. It's a long walk. So you DJ these big parties in the desert. That sounds fucking rad, dude. It's really just a bunch of friends coming together. Like, yes. You know, we we go out there and look. What was crazy about this last year is we actually had two openers before I went on to DJ. <laughs> wow, which was, dude, that's, that's big deal. And it was cool too because we put up this, we tied up this huge like two hundred foot screen. I got like a, um, you know, the movie. Uh, what's it called like a drive-in movie theater yeah there was this this projector i'd rented you had visuals oh my god yeah oh, we like inverted dude. the visuals from the back dude. and we, i use like some of the film visuals and like videos from the years before and like i learned <laughs> how you could sync it up so on the drop of stuff no. when you switch it over it like all of a sudden is playing this crazy visual from the year before and everyone's going crazy yeah it's yeah <laughs> that's that was fucking electric dude <laughs> Yeah, your travel films in the background. Yeah. <laughs> Just, yeah, dude. You're doing backflips. Oh, okay. I had a question. Okay. So, okay. So I went to on Instagram, your second post ever is you doing a backflip. Oh, and yeah. I was, no, no, but listen, listen, I was wondering. So you, Sam Calder, Matt Como, do you guys, did you guys get like invited to the school for the backflip thing? Oh yeah. How did, okay. That's what it is. The academy, right? Yeah. So, uh, so I can do an, I can do a backflip, but, but I didn't get into the academy. I'm too oh, tall. Okay. But got, I can't do a backflip. You got People disinvited. Do, yeah. do you guys just all, you just learn that right off the bat when you got the camera, it came yeah. in the mail from Canon. They were like, Hey, you have to learn how to do the backflip. It's more of a secret society. Okay. But, yeah. Okay. You know, it's, 
I can only share so much. Okay, I'm NBA, actually in the secret but... society. I just wasn't in the academy. Oh, I'm a late okay. I can't. Uh, it's on my Instagram. I don't know if that's how You'll it works. You'll see it. <laughs> 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 the solid one. But you you were you were traveling a ton in in like 2016, 2017. You yeah. were you're going all around the world. Uh, I think a lot of people. I, I did the travel thing as well when mm. I started. It was super fun. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah did. you did too. Yeah. Did you yeah, do yeah, travel? Yeah, I did. We did travel, dude. Travels around. Just lots of traveling on this side of the table. Lots of traveling on that side of the table. What um when when you were when you were getting into it, what sparked the you know? Obviously, it's beautiful. We love going to see these new That's places, true. right? Were you having brands fund this stuff in the beginning, or were you saving up your bread, working another job, and then travel? Like that's what I did to start it out, and then yeah. you know, kind of go off and get to see some cool places. How did it become kind of part of your business? What yeah, were you doing? it's actually kind of a funny story. So I, I moved out to Los Angeles in like twenty. I don't remember now. 2016, 2017. and some of my first clients out here were like fitness influencers on Instagram. I actually just met this guy on the street and he was filming himself with a tripod. Over on like and the third street promenade? Just d- No, d- he was literally at LACMA. <laughs> like he was just out oh, on the field sure. and I was walking by and this dude, he's jacked and he's like throwing a medicine ball against the wall, like filming these videos. And I just moved out here, had no clients, <laughs> like, whatever. Yeah, this is LA. That's when I, it was wild. I got yeah. to do that. Yeah, dude. <laughs> I just, I walked up to this guy. I was like, yo, dude, like, this looks cool. Like, you, do you ever need a hand with this? Like, we could make something really crazy. I'm also ripped. Do you need a <laughs> yeah, spot? Like, right, right. And uh, <laughs> anyway, all of a sudden, I, we went and started filming these like crazy fitness edits. They're like out there somewhere. And all of a sudden, all his friends started wanting them and all the people that saw them and all this stuff. So all of a sudden, I just filled up my clientele with these fitness influencers. They had like, uh, a protein brand deal to do, you know, once a week or once a month. And I was like filling in all those slots for them. I was like, yeah, we can do this for the next couple of months or whatever. And, um, at one point I was like, you know, this is great, but I really wanted to diversify the portfolio and a lot of friends, you know, maybe it's just cause it's what I was seeing or whatever. But uh, I was like, you know, it would be really cool to try to get some brand deals to go travel and do the different things. And I kind of just put it out there. I had some friends that were going to be in Europe and had brand deals for stuff and yada, you know how it goes. And, um, I went to all the fitness clients and I told them, I was like, hey guys, I'm gonna be gone for four months. Um, we can get all the content you need for everything, but we'll just need to film it over this next month. And so I just booked all the days with everything, filmed everything, and then got a flight, went overseas, and started filming with these other guys that were shooting for brand deals, doing road trips, doing all this stuff. And I was kind of funding it by just editing out the content over the four month period while I was overseas. And so I kind of had this buffered zone while it was happening and then I ended up just extending it a little bit. And then one of the first trips I went on was with this YouTuber, JR Alley. And, yes. and you know, Lee yeah. as well. I know JR. He shoots I've with seen Carl his stuff. a lot. Okay. Le- um, what was the other guy's name? Lee Shin. He shoots okay. with Carl Shakurla. Okay. Um, but so I went with them to Norway and there was like, uh, the, a phone company was sponsoring it and all this stuff. And then all of a sudden, you know, back in the day, I used to talk a lot more about, you know, the work you put out is the work that you get. You know, if you put out wedding films, you're gonna get wedding films or like wedding clients. And I started putting out just travel stuff, vlogs, you know, different edits and all these things. And then clients started coming along, you know, word of mouth, they're like, hey, you know, we love the stuff you're already in Europe or like, could you go to Asia to shoot this thing or to shoot this or that? And like the rates weren't that great. I was like, dude, yeah, this like, (laughs) this will get us by, this sounds awesome. Um, And that's really how it started. I mean, there's like a, a lot more of the story to that, but, um, it was really just getting out there and actually doing it. And I was at the time I was like, I want more travel content on the page. And then all of a sudden we just kept going and kept the momentum going. So it's funny, dude, because I was so I was in Norway and I was making travel videos. <laughs> <laughs> Clients never came, dude. <laughs> <laughs> they never came. I made a lot of them. Dude, dude I made a video tons, a week, yeah. bro. Video, you gotta, he week. was doing every day though. Oh, uh, every day? This, oh, that's why. true. And I was thinking, dude, I'm gonna get paid for this, bro. <laughs> <laughs> and then I never did. I went home. <laughs> Never you know, been back. It, it sounds easier, like in retrospect, where I'm like, okay, saying the story, it sounds you're like, oh, cool, it just worked out, like all this stuff. But then there, there were like weeks and months and stuff where you're like paying for, you right. know, like, okay, we're still out here doing this, like, yeah, we're not making any money, like, oh, cool, the credit card's maxed, and now, okay, the the invoice came, okay, was, you know, it's just like this like crazy game of trying to make it work. And I was always like, I can go back home, and you know, we'll we'll figure this out, but everything in me wanted to make it work. And so there was definitely a lot of stressful moments for sure. But, you know, looking back at it, that really was what caused the momentum was actually just being out there. And, you know, if you want to make commercial work, make 
convert make spec ads you know if you want to do weddings shoot weddings you can be a portrait photographer and shoot portraits you know kind of the same concept but when you were doing the the travel stuff so i, I did a, a lot of it i was living out overseas for a little bit and i felt like there came a time where i was loving it like it was super fun but mm-hmm. when you're away for like months at a time and like you were right <laughs> yeah. is there is there a moment I, I got like island fever fever i'm like okay get me the fuck out of bali dude this yeah. place is sick it's awesome but like we've been here too long and i miss i need to like work on other shit and like my work had dried up i was like losing money at that point yeah. i'm like dude we're just spending money like i, I don't have anything coming in i'm thinking i'm gonna go over there and just absolutely destroy it wasn't making a ton of bread and we came back did did you feel that when you were on the road for four months living out of your suitcase was there a point where you're like get me the hell out of here or would you right now tomorrow start it back no. up again it's one of those things that's kind of hard to talk about because it's like oh poor you right i know right? i know yeah i know, yeah, what, I know. A, what a shame yeah, what right? a shame you you're were, traveling the world yeah and you're you just, loving it you couldn't, couldn't do, do it, it. yeah you couldn't do it whatever no but i feel like you did you miss home it's like uh, yeah. a thing dude you, you miss do. home that year is i think the the year that I was gone, I think it was 2018, if I remember right. And I came back and then got a, another job, went back out, and I ended up being gone for more than 300 days the oh, entire year. So wow. it was like 10 months gone. And I remember coming back and I was like, oh my God, I have no routine. I have no anything. I feel so scattered. Like, okay, why do I even live in Los Angeles? Like, what? There's just all these questions. I had like moved all my stuff in a storage unit and was like okay what's the next step here and the next step for me was actually just trying to be more grounded out here and like okay i think being a dp would be the next kind of step here going from filmmaker to we could have a a more stable income and be in the city and actually leverage the work and the the people we know and everything you know just like have more momentum here than just be all over the world trying to like run around for a check you know Totally. Stuff, but, but again, it's hard to say. Yeah, that totally. I know. It's fun. It's dude, great. It's such a privilege. Yeah, yeah, exactly. To go see it. What was one of the favorite spots that you got to to see on this this world tour? My two favorites, I always say, is South Africa and Hong Kong. Those were like just some of the most out there places. Like I, I went to South Africa for a month, partly because we were there for something. And then I just, just nothing really popped up. And so we were there for like an entire month. And then I think it was a few months later, I went to Hong Kong. And I've been to some really cool places since, but I, I think there's nothing like being in a place for the first time mm-hmm. and just getting to walk around, you know, having never been to that part of Asia and then just being immersed in the culture there. You're and like, being that Dude. young. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. How old were you when you did it? What is that? 2018. Would have been just turning 20. Oh, wow. Then. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's crazy. Right. Traveling the world at 20 is like that's crazy. Well, that, that's what was funny too. There was also this, not necessarily imposter syndrome, but some of these projects you roll up and I remember sitting down we were on this project in China and we're at this table with all these executives from the hotel and they're like, wait, how old are you? And I got sent out just to like direct and DP this, like this piece for them. And then I was kind of like, oh, you know, you know. I'm like, oh, I'm 19, you know, like, like not like just kind of under the breath, whatever. And they're like, cause you know, in, in Asian culture, like it's very common to live at, at home until you're like 26, 27. It's just like part of the culture there. And they're like, what? And they're like, I, I have sons and daughters that are older than you, you know, like, what are we doing here? This is crazy. But then kind of getting over that imposter syndrome where you're like, no, no, they, they brought me out here for a reason. You know, this is, we're here to do our work. They loved our work. Let's, let's deliver on it. And then, you know, just kind of brush it under the rug. Cause it, at some point it'll go away. You know? so, Dude, I filmed a, I filmed like a mini little content thing in, in like Northern China. And it was similar. We're sitting around a table, all these executives, all in Chinese. We have like a microphone, kind of like this. And they're asking me, they're talking all so in, in, in Mandarin. And then someone's like pointing at me, like clearly like, what does he think about it? Yeah. And I only knew how to say, I love blank. And the company's called Hetao. It was like a distillery. So I said, <laughs> Wa yi Hetao. <laughs> and then people are like, all right, never mind. But they asked me later that night, they said, what rank videographer are you in America? Because everything is ranked there. Yeah, yeah. And I was just like, 137. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, it's pretty real. You know, it's, um, it's believable. Uh, I t- dude, I'd take, you, I, I'd take you higher than 137. Yeah, but I mean, I was, hey, I was like 21. Yeah, yeah. Morning, you know? I mean, 137. That's well, pretty, pretty fucking and they were, they were Everybody? But, and they all were like... Mm-hmm. Oh, and just, then they were like they, they pointed to the um, mixologist who like tasted the the cocktails they were trying out and like everything and he could he was insane he could tell you like how much alcohol the content by just tasting it and they're like he's number four <laughs> mixologist <laughs> in all of China and I mean dude, I'm like I believe you dude yeah like, that's but it's, dude, we got a 137 you get like a there. shirt you get like a shirt well, I'm yeah. 137 oh my Regional. Regional. similar thing though. I was like what am I doing here that's funny <laughs> okay so I scrolled down on your Instagram and, and went to that 2018 timeline yeah. and it you have a significant shift in, in your content mm. I mean like 
your your colors change, the tones change. Mm. Like I specifically remember discovering like the HSL sliders in yeah. Lightroom and, and not knowing about them and then going and be like, oh shit, I can make like <laughs> the grass fucking orange if right, I wanted yeah. to and, and I can change the skin tones. And so what was like the catalyst for that significant shift in your content? Because it went from like good to like, oh shit, Mitchell's got some dank tones <laughs> and grit and like great photos, but like the stuff was, uh, there was a significant change. And so I guess what sparked that change? I mean, it kind of goes back to my answer earlier. There's just a lot of curiosity, right? Like I think seeing a lot of work online, you go, oh my yeah. God, like how did, how did he get, how did he do that? You know? And then just pulling frames and like, could I do that? Like, could how could I take this to there? Like what what's the gap here? And it's a lot of just trial and error, I think. And then going back again, like your style is your preference. Like just seeing like, okay, like I, I definitely prefer this edit over this one, prefer these colors over those, like yada, yada, and just trying to work it into your workflow. And yeah. then I don't, I, I, that period you're talking about is like very like teal and orange, and totally. like, you know, whatever, but yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's cool. It's also interesting because the type of content is like single photo bangers. It's like, now it's kind of like <laughs> iPhone photo dump, yeah. like carousels, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. reels. And yeah, shit. like, mm -hmm. do you feel like the travel influencer space or travel content creator space is still like alive and well? And like, do you think you could still do that if you wanted to? And is it like a feasible, I guess, like career choice? It definitely is. Okay. I, I almost feel like it's more feasible now gotcha. than, than ever before. I probably, mostly just because of short form video, sure. right? Like I think it's shifted where if you were going to be like a landscape photographer and I'm not in the landscape photographer community, but you know, if I was in it, maybe I'd say it's thriving, but the, uh, it, you know, every, everything now is social of like, okay, here's an Instagram reel for this hotel, Instagram reel for, you know, that's just what's performing really well for, you know, tours and boards and different cities and different, all these things. And so I think just because more people have access to see what these places are like as well, more companies see the value in it. Obviously I'm just preaching to the choir here, but like, it, it, it's like any other industry and like, uh, you know, I mean, I'm grateful to know a ton of guys that they do it full time. Yeah. And it's, it's one of those things, I think until you see it and you see guys making a great living, kind of jumping around the world and, and shooting for different brands all the time, you would have never thought it was possible. But today, like it, it, buzzword, but like a decentralization of like, of, of, of being able to do business all over the world and, have social media kind of as, as that leverage point is insane. And until you see it, you're like, you can't believe it. It's ridiculous. But, the but first, it's real. Yeah, the first guy you meet, I feel like it's like, I'm making videos for brands. You're like, what are you doing? Yeah, like, right. Like, how you are you doing you that? You how much? Yeah, no, <laughs> it's crazy. It's you know? ridiculous, yeah, it's dude. Wild. It's wild. You're, you're curious. You've are you got all these different facets that you're, you're going into, but I have a question about you as a bird man. Yes. <laughs> we're, we're bird guys. We're fellow okay. bird guys. Yeah. And, and I personally- I stay on the ground. I, yeah. per I personally like to crash the bird sometimes. <laughs> And I've crashed a lot of the birds. <laughs> yeah. It's fun. and I have yeah. a motto though. I have a motto that if you're not crashing, you're not, you're not ripping, dude. You're and, not and, trying and I, hard. And mm. I believe that. And I believe that. So I'm wondering, uh, what what bird do you use? And do you have you crashed the bird? What's your relationship dude. with crashing the bird? <laughs> we, we, we used to always say, be like, you don't plan on crashing today, do you? <laughs> oh, okay, good. Like as long as you weren't planning on crashing, like we're good. <laughs> <laughs> we're like, we're, like <laughs> That's fun. we're gonna I mean, start we're gonna doing start that. that. Yeah. We used but, to chase but, each other around every Wednesday night just before we started doing podcasts. Yeah. We just fucking chase each other with our yeah. Little we would birds. just I'd be like, "Oh, I got you, dude!" Yeah. And like be like Star be Wars. Like, yeah, dude. yeah. Like, <laughs> like we watched the footage. I'm like, oh, I almost crashed. Oh, oh. He, oh, dude, he crashed his mic. I crashed bro. my mic. There you back. Know, back. But anyways, That's yeah. Not what I did. How do you so good at it? <laughs> <laughs> hey, how, how, how do that? <laughs> how do you do that, yeah. bro? <laughs> Seriously though, how do you? <laughs> <laughs> I can tell us. <laughs> I'm just, just just practice, bro. Yeah. It's like anything, right? Yeah. You, you fly the bird. You you get in the sim. Oh, you're a sim happen. dude. So, I can't do the sim. So yeah. that's funny you say the sim thing. So we yeah. got the birds, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and DJI sends you that thing. They're like, you need to sim for an hour. Yeah. And I'm like, cancel. And we, and we we just went out and really we didn't crash trial for, by combat first day we didn't crash it's when we got irrational confidence that yeah, we started it's, it's when it's when you know okay so for those of you that don't know in the birds you can change the angle of the camera the pitch yeah. and so I said you know fuck it I'm going 26 degrees <sighs> just day one 26 I want to go fast dude I want to go and fast and I, I will say Braden flies so fast <laughs> and it is so fun and he like, drives really it's fast just, too. it's just it's just <laughs> like life dude it's just like life I'll I'll, break. exactly you know and I'm like I'm going full blast like I can't do it slow if you're like oh i need you to, i'm like 
that if you needed a speed guy, you could call me. I could figure it out. <laughs> when we first started, I'd be like just like practicing some turns, you know, I'd hear, and then I'll, I'll be like, where are you, Brady? And I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> just fly right over And then like, I hit a tree. I hit a tree. I'm like, all right, all right let's go get you it. You know, not, not to throw any shade, but I, I do feel like you can tell a beginner by how much this they throw. This is bullshit, dude. This is bullshit. Seriously, oh, seriously. Oh, if, bullshit, if you're dude. just in the air and you hear, like you're like, ah, oh, there's Ricky hour, fresh, dude. fresh on the stick. Fresh on it's, the stick. Yeah. It's less. It's it's less less, you're less pitch on uh-huh. the angle, uh-huh. and then just you can kind of have more mobility. You know? This is bullshit, dude. <laughs> <laughs> he, he doesn't apply. The I don't rules apply that rule, dude. dude. How often are you flying, dude? I don't fly that much anymore. Really, to be really? Honest. Yeah, the I I posted. It was funny. We actually did a. Do you know Keen Luong? Who Keen Luong Tantago on Instagram? I don't. Oh, maybe. He's he's a phenomenal pilot as well. I feel like I saw a video yeah. one time of of this guy coming out of the dirt. That was both of us. That was you guys. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay, yeah. So, okay, okay. So we so we actually got into FPV together and got to be on a ton of different projects, um, flying like we got to rip some of the mosques in in Dubai Shit, and all these different no just way. like fly out of a hot air balloon, chase an airplane, like all these things. And we were just in it at the same time. And after like a year or two, we just had the gnarliest close. And we we're like, do we just do a collab reel? And so that was the video we like filmed the intro where we like got out of the dirt and then uh, it popped up on the TV. But oh, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, remember, I remember this. One. But I, dude, just I was I haven't flown like that in a while. Like the the motivation back then when it was like really fresh and and it was also a great you know I could be wrong because there's plenty of guys in it, but the 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 business side of it isn't as much there for me. Like when it was really new and novel, you you could really charge a lot more, I think, and it was so fresh and everyone wanted it. Whereas I do feel like it's a bit overused sometimes now, but there's, there's a good balance to it. Um, but back then it was like, yo, who could get the gnarliest clips? Who could like, you know, what if we like power loop this thing or like do some crazy flip through this, that window? Like, oh my God, it'd be yeah. crazy. Did you ever send it through a window? If you want to crash, oh, by the yeah. way, you call me and Chase. We're willing yeah. to do it every Wednesday. Oh, you guys are down to crash? Yeah. Right? So oh, you call dude, me, but cool. did you, yeah. uh, did you ever do anything like where you hit it stuff really hard? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. That, oh yeah! Oh yeah! That. They like hit a, like trying to do a flip in, in a building, <laughs> and you go through the building. <laughs> Not through. The, so, okay, so that one of the scariest flights I've ever done, which I didn't crash on this one, but I'll tell you when I did crash, is we got to fly inside of a mosque. Fuck that! In oh, Dubai, dude, and it was completely empty. I'm All the crash, people were outside, and, and Ke- <laughs> Keen and I were in there. And we were like, yo, this is risky. Like, yeah. this is like, it, you do not crash. Oh, like, it, was, it was a hired thing, though, right? It was yeah, like, yeah, it was yeah, hired. Okay. They just have handcuffs there. You crash. <laughs> like, ready for it? <laughs> Get we, out of here, dude. We didn't crash. So that was pretty high risk. But I have crashed. I, actually, the first time I flew FB, I crashed so bad. I didn't realize, like, in the sim, when you pull up, say you're going 80 miles an hour, and you just pull up on the, on the throttle or whatever, and you, like, want to lift off, you can in the sim. In real life, I was like, we went out to Toronto Pinnacles, and I just dove one of the pinnacles and it never occurred to me that if you're going 80 miles an hour straight into the ground and you want to pull up uh the gravity doesn't work that way and mm. so you just <laughs> and oh. so i like pull up nothing happens it was my first time flying oh, no. and i was like no <laughs> and then it just like no. exploded yeah <laughs> <laughs> when, you're, when you're flying like inside the mosque what so what what what's your setup you're building your own yeah you, yeah he's giving back, me back to and, and is, yeah. it, is it like a cine whoop thing no, we we're, no. we're flying open blade on five inch. You just so cut, you just cut the whole mosque on, in half. Only because you have so much more, like, I feel more confident with a okay. five inch than I do flying like the cine lifter or like the, the smaller ones. And those, and what, what exactly is that for people that don't know? It's like, so they have different types of FPV drones where the, the five inch is you have like an open blade and that, that's like the diameter of the wingspan of okay. the, the arm. And uh, they have some smaller ones and they have like little uh what would you call them like propeller guards yes they go on it so you know if you're flying by people or you're flying over a crowd if you hit someone it might bounce off their leg but if you hit someone with an open blade with like props out you're gonna slice their leg in half so i, <laughs> so, I shouldn't i shouldn't buy the prop the, props out is sick yeah, <laughs> yeah prop, props, out. props out do you have That's any funny. other non fpv related travel horror stories i mean you were on the road for travel. 300 days like you must have gotten into like, are you getting, oh. you know, food, like food poisoning in, in Bali, Bali or, you, Bali? or like, I do, this is a really crazy story. I, I haven't really shared with too many people, but we were actually in Bali and not to get Bali bad rep or anything. I love Bali. Spent a lot of time there, but, uh, we went out one morning, like really far off to go hike this mountain. And apparently I forget a lot of the details here, so spare me, but, um, 
we read online that you like have to pay the like mafia that's at the bottom to go up this mountain or something. And it's like only tour or whatever, but there are a couple of stories of people that you just go early in the morning, you can go hike the mountain and nobody will really tell you off or anything. Anyway, we go out there and we're like, we're just going to go do this ourselves. Like, I don't want to be a part of a tour group. I want to just go up, fly the drone, do all these things. And uh, we go out there at like three in the morning, we're like passing by and we pass by this parking lot of all these people on our scooters. And all of a sudden, like three guys come out on their scooters after us. It's like pitch black in the middle of these alleyways, like, you know, pretty wild. And we're like, yo, dude, these guys are following us. Like, what what are we doing? And um, it was me and my friend Jackson Thomas. It was like years and years, like forever ago now. But we get out and these, these guys like speed by us, come around and stop. And we're like kind of at a distance. We're like, yo, dude fuck like this these guys are like right here and the guy comes up he's like hey you you pay to go on this tour or whatever like no no we're just we're just turning around like we're going up the thing and he was like no you're not you're going this direction like there's no outlet here like whatever we're like no no we're just turning around like all is good whatever and he lunges at me and pulls the keys out of my hand or like out of the bike or whatever and then we're like yo dude and these like other two guys are approaching and, oh, <laughs> and this is like a terrible position to be in no yeah. one's out here we're like oh my god it was, it was awful and um essentially what happened before these guys two guys came up is jackson like walked around to the side and then i like grabbed the guy's arm and we like pulled him in and we grabbed the keys and just and just started off oh let's no way. Way. <laughs> crazy because i was like i don't want before these two other guys get up here, I don't. I don't want anything with what they have wow. to do. Oh, that <laughs> is just, such a badass. And you, and you into they, that didn't story. they didn't chase you out of there. Well, they followed us the whole way out. Yeah, but, but then you just oh drove my, basically back home. Yeah, oh yeah, my we god, we just drove back out. I didn't expect wow. it to be like, and then we just went Batman and Robin on yeah. this guy. Yeah. Was, I thought you were saying like, and then we talked yeah, our way out of it. We boxed. Yeah. Holy he shit! He flanked him. I fucking ripped his arm. We got out of there. <laughs> but your, your decisions there are like, okay, what? Yeah. You have the we're going to be overpowered and like. 10 oh, seconds yeah. or we can grab the keys from this guy in his hand who knows you know uh-huh. and get out of here oh, and that's what we did so that, that was probably one of the like wildest that's like, sus dude yeah i don't i don't tell that story oh that. my that's god sick. that's crazy and exclusive yeah, yeah you yeah. made it out though dude <laughs> okay mitchell what is some of the best advice you've ever received Ooh, i know i know <laughs> I feel like I, we got to start. Yeah, I gotta, like, what, in, in what domain? What are we, you know, in, in anything life. in life, whether whether it was filmmaking, whether it's just like going out to L.A. and moving out here. Um, what, what, what was something that someone told you that really stuck with you that you can kind of share with some of our audience? Mm. I don't know if there's anything in particular is like a, someone told me this and it changed everything. No, kinda, totally, totally. Kind of thing. But for me personally, it's really just been seeing everything through. Right. It's like just just being consistent with your work being consistent with anything that you do because i think that's that's where the results are right there's there it's not worth doing things half-assed it's not you know no matter what you do you can always adjust along the way and you know whether that's you know even just moving out here and just just doing it even if you're scared to do something just doing it scared just making it happen and doing it to the best it can be done and then after that, you can adjust course. You know, it's like even with the, some of the pieces that we put out, like Rivian and stuff, you know, there's, you know, we did it to the best that we can. Okay, adjust course now. What do we make of this? What's the next step? How do we do this? Boom, the product comes out. You know, it's, there's so many things that I see flaws in or this and that. And, but it's like, okay, we're going to do it to the best of our ability, adjust course. And I, I believe that's how all successful people operate, right? Is you're like, you, you do the thing and then you make the adjustment. And you continue up the ladder of, of your mission and it kind of falls into course as it happens. And so I think in retrospect, that's maybe just a theme that's been true for, you know, the last decade or so of just doing it. And then I think everything else follows that. If you're consistent in any area of, of your life, you know, if you're just repeatedly doing these actions that, that give you confidence, you're going to become confident. If you're repeatedly working on your craft as a filmmaker, you're going to be a great filmmaker. You know, if you want to be a business podcaster, you know, artist, anything, I feel like that's the secret sauce. So I feel like all of the advice that, you know, I could have heard years ago or different things kind of boiled down into that mindset of let's do everything with the best of our ability. Let's pursue mastery and you know, and then make the most of it. For sure. We we always typically end on advice to your 18 year old self, but mm, I feel like that kind yeah. of falls within yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely. love the, I love what you said about doing it scared. Cause mm-hmm. usually you're like, oh, I'm too scared. I'm not going to do it. Yeah. So doing it scared is a cool, it's just a cool sentence. Yeah. I, I think like you should be scared. If you're doing something you've never done before, you're going right. into uncharted territory. 
So you should be a little bit scared because yeah. it's unknown. Mm-hmm. And I never feel like that feeling, as long as you're doing new and novel things, like that feeling should never go away. If anything, it's just noticing and like cutting the half-life down on it. Of like, okay, okay. Mm-hmm. I Here's like recognizing that feeling like, okay, I am a little timid or scared going into this. Like that, that might be a good sign for this. It doesn't mean I need to be scared the whole time. You know, I felt this before or like, you know, even with anything that's happening or, or, you know, in productions, there's a million moving parts. And I think the beauty is just recognizing when you've been in a situation before, you know, you go, oh man, I'm stressed or I'm upset with this, or that, or whatever. How many times have we been here? A million times. Oh, what's it? It's most likely going to play out like this. Okay. Well, let's just, you know, if it's most likely going to go this direction and we're going to overcome this challenge, let's just try to do it the best we can. And then, you know, you got, plays out so gotta far, see so. it through my boy. Bad. Gotta, gotta see, it see it through, through dude. <laughs> hey, ladies so. and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in to episode 95 of the 505 podcast. You're still here. Please leave a like, drop a sub, give us a comment. We'll see you guys all next week. Peace. Later. Bye. Bye.